Recently, words like Miami Mall, 10FT8 Creature trended on X, formerly Twitter, a social media platform. Laya Heilpern, who resides in Miami, says she was at the scene when the cop cars swarmed the mall. Heilpern says she and her friend pulled over to ask people what was going on, and they spoke to a panicked eyewitness who claimed to see a 10FT8 tall creature. Another person said they saw something straight out of the Alien movies. Heilpern pulls out her phone to record a video, but the cops grab it and make her delete it. Interestingly, internet personalities noticed a blurry gray thing walking around the mall in one of the videos taken of the mall. Is that a Nephilim? No one knows. Who were the Nephilim? Certainly the description may imply that they were of great stature. Perhaps giants in the build of their bodies. Greatly feared and were well known, presumably for extreme wickedness. Perhaps they were certain individuals of the offspring resulting from this mixing of the sons of God and the daughters of man, who became extremely evil. An interesting point concerning the Nephilim is the phrase, and also afterward. It seems this is referring to after the flood, as Nephilim are mentioned once again in Numbers 13.33, though it is spelled differently in Hebrew. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Numbers 13.33 The Nephilim in Numbers 13 were indeed giant in stature as the text indicates. By the time of the flood, there was so much ungodliness that God describes it this way. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 5, 8. In Genesis 6, there is a reference to the offspring that resulted from the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Notably, there were giants on the earth before the flood. They were remarkable due to the wickedness in their family lineage. The context implies that the Nephilim were the resulting offspring of spirit beings and humans. It is more accurate to see the sons of God as either demons, angels in rebellion against God, or uniquely demon-possessed men, and the daughters of men as human women. Jude 6, and angels who did not keep their own designated place of power but abandoned their proper dwelling place. These have kept eternal chains under the thick gloom of utter darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude 6 also explains what God did with these evil angels. These beings were filled with lust when they saw the daughters of men, and the angels cohabitated with the women, thus producing offspring who were half angelic and half human, known as Nephilim. However, these beings would not have free reign on the earth. God was going to send a great flood. The great flood pictures the world back then, full of life and busy with all sorts of things happening. But even with all this, there was a dark problem growing. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was also evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. People were going about their lives, but something wasn't right. There was corruption, violence, and a kind of darkness that had settled over humanity. God then saw Noah as a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. God tells Noah in Genesis 6, 13-14, I am going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Can you imagine what Noah must have felt being given such a monumental task to build an ark, a giant boat in preparation for a catastrophic flood that would wipe out every living thing? God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when he says no more. The Bible gives us hints at a world that had deviated far from what God intended. So, as Noah builds his ark, a massive vessel about 450 eft long, 75 eft wide, and 45 eft high, you can feel that something really bad is about to happen. Let us put Noah's ark's size into perspective with things we're familiar with today. Imagine a football field, which is usually about 360 eft long. Now Noah's Ark at 450 ft long would be even longer than that, like a football field with an extra 90 ft or about the length of another quarter of a field packed on. That's pretty huge, right? 
For the width, think about a standard basketball court. It's about 50 FT wide. The arc was 75 FT wide, like one and a half basketball courts side by side. You could play a pretty big game on that. And for the height, it was 45 FT high, picturing a four-story building. Each story in a building is usually about 10 to 12 FT, so the arc was as tall as a medium-sized apartment building. Altogether, imagine a super long football field, one and a half basketball courts wide, and as tall as a small apartment building. That was the size of Noah's Ark, like a giant floating building on the water. Continuing from the story, Noah gathers his family and pairs of all living creatures as instructed by God. The Ark turns into a sign of safety and hope during the flood. Then the rains come. It's not just a heavy downpour. It's like the heavens themselves have opened up. Water covers the earth higher than the mountains. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Only Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. Genesis 7, 21, 23. After 40 days and 40 nights, the rain stopped. The waters eventually subsided, and the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. Now think of this like parking your car on a big tall hill after a massive storm. But instead of a car, it's a massive boat. And instead of a hill, it's a whole group of big mountains. Noah and his family step out into a new world. God makes a covenant with Noah, promising never to destroy the earth with a flood again, marked by the rainbow in the sky. You would think this would be the last time we read about the Nephilim or giants. But after this, we see various instances. The exploration of Canaan reveals that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood. However, it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. We go to Numbers 13.33, where we meet a new set of characters, Moses, the Israelite spies, and the inhabitants of Canaan, including the descendants of Anak, who are linked to the Nephilim. The Bible introduces them during the story of Moses sending 12 spies to explore the land of Canaan. The spies come back with a startling report. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. This verse suggests that the descendants of Anak were related to the Nephilim, known for their great size and strength. Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egypt, sent spies to scout the Promised Land. The spies come back terrified, saying, Hold on, didn't we just say the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood? In the Old Testament, giant is most commonly referred to by the word Rapha, and throughout the entirety of the Old Testament's narrative, the Raphim serve as a fascinating and significant recurring motif. Where does the Bible mention Rapha? The Raphaim are first mentioned in Genesis 14. The Raphaim along with other large people are also mentioned in Deuteronomy 2.20.21. It is also regarded as the land of the Raphaim because the Raphaim previously lived in it, but the Ammonites call them Zamzumim. The people is great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. The name Raphaim, which literally means terrible ones, gives us an indication of the intimidating and fearsome nature of these individuals. This is not the only time we see these giants. After the flood, in Deuteronomy 3, there is an interesting story about King Og of Bashan, a giant man. Og is referred to as the last of the Raphim in Deuteronomy 3.1, and later in the books of Numbers and Joshua. Rapha is a Hebrew word for giants. In the days of Moses, Og, king of Bashan, was a mighty and infamous Amorite king of Bashan who reigned at Ashtaroth. He fought the Israelites on their way to the Promised Land. As the Israelites journeyed towards the Promised Land, they encountered many formidable foes, and King Og was one of them. He fought fiercely against the Israelites and led his entire army against them. Israel had to deal with King Og of Bashan, who sent his entire army against Israel. The Israelites then marched toward Bashan, where King Og confronted them at Edre. Because of Og's reputation, the Israelites were terrified. Do not be afraid of me, for I have delivered him into your hands along with his entire army and his land, God assured Moses. The book of Deuteronomy includes a narrative of a conflict that occurred between forces led by Moses and those led by Og. According to the biblical account, Og was the ruler of 60 different walled cities, all of which were taken by the Israelites. Israel slew the entire forces and conquered all 60 cities in the kingdom of Og, which had the same tall walls as Sihon. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. In addition to this, he was a very large man, 
and slept in a bed made of iron that was 9 cubits long and 4 cubits wide, 13.5 ft long and 6 ft wide. The inclusion of this detail draws attention to Og's massive stature. A man in need of this size bed was most likely tall. Israel destroyed the entire population and took control of all 60 of the cities in the kingdom, which had the same high walls as Sihon. When God decided to hand over an enemy to his people, high-walled cities were no match. Later, at the city of Jericho, the most spectacular demonstration of that truth would occur. According to Deuteronomy 3.1, Og was a descendant of the Raphim, indicating a man of great stature or giant. His colossal bed had become famous and no doubt had been saved as a memento. Joshua chapter 12, 4. And the territory of Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Raphim, lived at Ashtaroth and at Edre. After this, we then see another giant, the most well-known giant in history, Goliath from the Bible. He was a champion from the Philistine camp who fought as an armored charioteer. He was dressed in what we'd call a mail coat. The Philistines warmed up by donning a large canvas-like undergarment with overlapping bronze ringlets from shoulder to knee. This coat of mail shielded the wearer from the enemy's weapons. Body armor of this size and type weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which equates to between $175 and $200 in modern terms. The armor only included the coat of mail. Goliath, on the other hand, wore a bronze helmet, bronze leggings, greaves to protect his shins, and carried a bronze javelin or spear slung between his shoulders. Was Goliath a Nephilim? Some scholars believe that Goliath the Gittite, a Gath resident, belonged to a race known as the Nephilim. Other experts argue that Goliath was a Rapha because the Nephilim were destroyed in the Great Flood during Noah's time, and only Noah's family survived. Some scholars believe the Philistines descended from the Anakim. Goliath's champion status is enhanced by the fact that Gath was an ancient Anakim stronghold. Some scientists believe Goliath has an identifiable family tree, implying autosomal dominant inheritance which causes familial acromegaly or gigantism. The relations of Goliath are not entirely clear. There are also other giants mentioned in 2 Samuel 21 15 22 and 1 Chronicles 20 4 8 who are related to Goliath in the Bible. This event occurred when David was old. 2 Samuel chapter 21. There was war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He also was a descendant of the giants. And when he taunted and defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. These four warriors were descended from the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hands of David and his servants. Since Goliath was from Gath, these were Goliath's sons or brothers. How did they survive the flood? But here's the big question. If the Nephilim were around before the great flood, and the flood wiped out all but Noah and his family, how could the descendants of Anak, which are linked to the Nephilim, be around after the flood. When we consider the flood, we read about it in the Bible. He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground, Genesis 7:23. This verse makes it clear that the flood was incredibly comprehensive in its destruction. So how could the Nephilim have survived such an event? There are different opinions on this. Some suggest that the Nephilim mentioned it after Ward in Genesis were a new group unrelated to those before the flu. Others propose that the term Nephilim might not refer to a specific lineage, but rather a title or description given to giants or mighty warriors against different races. It's also possible that after the flood, the demons made it with human females again, resulting in more Nephilim. It's even possible that some Nephilim characteristics were passed down through the lineage of one of Noah's daughters-in-law. Another perspective comes from the Book of Numbers 13.33, where the Nephilim are mentioned again long after the flood. The spies sent by Moses to spy on the land of Canaan reported, There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, who came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. This passage suggests that neither the Nephilim nor a similar group of giants existed post-flood. So, did the Nephilim survive the flood? Or were the post-flood giants a different group altogether? As we think about this mystery, it reminds us of the many interesting stories and people in the Bible. It makes us want to learn more, ask questions, and be curious. Based on a few theories that Bible scholars and enthusiasts consider, some suggest that Nephilim might not have referred to a specific group of people, 
but rather was a term used to describe any large and mighty warriors. So, the descendants of Anak might not have been direct descendants of the pre-flood Nephilim, but were simply similar in stature and strength. Another idea is that something similar happened again after the flood. This time, the sons of God came down to earth and created a new group of Nephilim. This could be why there were giant people like the descendants of Anak and Canaan. A less popular theory is that the gene for the Nephilim somehow survived through one of Noah's family members. It's a bit of a stretch, but some people think that maybe the wives of Noah's sons carried this gene. In this perspective, the story isn't about physical giants but about moral and spiritual challenges. The giants represent the significant obstacles the Israelites had to overcome in their faith journey. So how do these pieces fit together? On one hand, we have Noah and his family, the sole human survivors of the flood. On the other, centuries later, there's a mention of the Nephilim or their descendants in Canaan. Flood but continuous sin. So why did God send the flood if he knew sin would still be around after it? Let's dig into this using Genesis 6-1-7 as our guide. One thought is that the amount of evil that happened in Noah's time was incredibly high, way more than usual. It wasn't just regular evil, it was non-stop, all-consuming wickedness. Maybe our world today, with all its problems, still doesn't compare to how bad it was back then. Another thought is that the whole situation with the sons of God, the Nephilim, and their offspring was super problematic. It's like the flood was specifically targeting this extreme form of evil that had developed. There's a bigger picture here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 tells us these stories are warnings. Jesus even talks about the days of Noah in Matthew 24, 37, 39, saying that just as people back then didn't see the flood coming, many people won't see his return coming. So the flood was a massive reset button for a world drowning in sin. But it was also a warning sign for future generations. It's like God saying, Look what happened back then. Don't make the same mistakes. God knew the flood wasn't going to solve the problem of sin forever. That's where Jesus comes in. The flood was part of a larger plan that would eventually lead to Jesus coming to deal with sin once and for all. Colossians 2.15 talks about how Jesus defeated the powers of evil. In the end, God's plan is way bigger than just the flood. He's looking toward a future where there's no more sin, no more pain, a new heaven, and a new earth, as Revelation 21.1 says. The flood was one step in that plan, a hard reset in a time of unimaginable wickedness, but also a signpost pointing us toward the need for a savior and the promise of a better world to come. The flood is not only a story. Spiritual warfare, the Nephilim, and the Great Flood are more than just ancient stories. They offer valuable lessons in spiritual warfare that are relevant to us today. Just like the Nephilim were part of the physical and spiritual problems of that time, we too face challenges that aren't just physical but spiritual. The union of the sons of God and the daughters of humans resulted in chaos, showing how stepping away from God's path can lead to serious consequences. In the same light, when we go against God's will for our lives, it can result in a significant impact on our spiritual lives. By relying on God's power, when we read about the descendants of Anak being linked to the Nephilim, it opens up a whole world of questions and interpretations. It's like piecing together a puzzle with some pieces missing. In other words, the Bible invites us to explore, to wonder, and to seek deeper understanding. The Flood Story, which talks about the mysterious Nephilim, fallen angels, and how evil had engulfed the earth, is a powerful story about how people are judged, how they can be saved, and how good people stay strong. It makes us ponder. How do we remain faithful in a world that often seems to be drifting away from moral and spiritual anchors? These stories teach us about the challenges of faith, the reality of facing giants in our lives, and the importance of trusting in God's plan. The Israelites, upon hearing about these giant descendants of Anak, were terrified. But this fear tested their faith and reliance on God. In our lives, we might not face literal giants, but we encounter our own descendants of Anak, big problems, fears, and challenges. Like the story of the Nephilim and the descendants of Anak, these challenges might seem overwhelming. But just as the Israelites were called to trust in God and face their giants, we too are called to have faith and confront our fears. The Bible encourages us to look beyond the surface, to seek understanding, and to find strength in faith. So, 
Next time you're up against a giant, remember the story of the descendants of Anak and the mysterious Nephilim. It reminds us that with faith, even the biggest challenges can be faced. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather in your presence today, our hearts and minds are filled with wonder and curiosity about the mysteries of your creation, especially the story of the Nephilim and the Great Flood. This ancient story, surrounded in mystery, speaks to us about your power. Regardless of the position one takes on understanding these particular verses, it is certainly a warning from God as to what happens when sin is allowed to rule over us. It's a reminder to make sure we raise up godly generations who call upon the name of the Lord and have boldness and courage to stand for God and His Word without compromise. All the way through Scripture, we read of examples where the people of God compromised God's Word with the pagan beliefs of the nations around them, and it destroyed them, and God judged them for it. We also see examples of where the people of God married ungodly people, and it destroyed families. This has been a problem since the beginning. It's another reminder to know God's Word, obey what He instructs us to do, and be aware of how sin is crouching at the door for each one of us to destroy us, each one of us to destroy us, each one of us to destroy us. Jesus' return is imminent. On the other hand, nobody can predict with certainty when Jesus will return. Yet no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, says Mark 13.32. Remarkably, right before Jesus ascended back into heaven, his disciples posed the identical query to him. <laughs> Jesus told them at that point that it was not their place to know the seasons or the times that the Father controlled. Jesus could therefore return tomorrow, next month, next year, or in a hundred years. What does this signify, therefore, for both of us? Always be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The devil tries to divert human attention from the signs and imminence of Jesus' return. Therefore, keep an eye on Jesus. Jesus is giving humanity as much time as possible to make a decision and follow him. Thus, he is patiently waiting to return. Jesus desires for as many people to turn from their sins and follow him back into heaven. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, says 2 Peter 3, 8-9. Instead of being lax about His promise, as some people think, the Lord is long-suffering toward us and wants everyone to come to repent rather than perish. A major element in Christian eschatology is the expectation of Jesus' return as a messenger of divine justice, bringing the righteous with Him and punishing the wicked. A number of biblical scriptures that portray the second coming as a time of reckoning, redemption, and the final victory of good over evil serve as the basis for this belief. The idea that Jesus will return with the righteous is based on multiple biblical passages that speak of an assembly of the faithful going with him. The passage, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of God's trumpet, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17, is one such illusion. And the first to rise are the dead in Christ. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be snatched up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. This artwork alludes to a meeting of the righteous, living, and dead to accompany Jesus on his victorious return. Revelation, the apocalyptic book in the New Testament, further elaborates on the imagery of Jesus as a divine judge. Revelation 19.11-16 describes Jesus riding a white horse, symbolizing purity and victory and wielding a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations. This visual representation emphasizes the authority and power with which Jesus will execute judgment upon the wrongdoers. The belief in Jesus bringing the righteous and punishing wrongdoers is not merely a theological abstraction, but holds profound implications for believers. It serves as a source of comfort and assurance for those who have lived in accordance with their faith, affirming the promise of eternal fellowship with Jesus. Simultaneously, it serves as a solemn warning for those who have engaged in wrongdoing, urging them to turn towards repentance and righteousness before the appointed time of judgment. The theological significance of this belief lies in its portrayal of divine justice, mercy, and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. It encapsulates the Christian understanding of God's redemptive plan for humanity, emphasizing the need for moral accountability and the assurance that justice will prevail in the end.
While interpretations of eschatological themes may vary among Christian denominations, the overarching message of Jesus' return as a culmination of divine justice and the reward of the righteous remains a fundamental tenet of Christian faith. The belief in Jesus bringing the righteous with him and punishing wrongdoers underscores the profound hope and responsibility that believers carry as they await the fulfillment of God's promises in the second coming.